Welcome back to Movie Shortens, where we have a daily double for you today as we have two recaps. In our first episode, a high school teacher suddenly gets the power to see glowing halos around those who will die soon. One day, she sees dozens of her students with the death glow. Can she figure out what disaster will take their lives? And if so, can she stop it in time? I guess we're going to find out. Rachel Stark is a young teacher who is giving her final exam, Romeo and Juliet. A student, Ben, hands in his paper and she sees there is nothing written on it. She will have to fail him for the semester. She grows despondent about it. Her boyfriend, the P.E. teacher, greets her in the hall. He can tell she's frustrated and Rachel complains that the students do nothing and don't care. This is Rachel's last week before she leaves the profession forever. Her boyfriend tries to dissuade her, saying she just needs a break. But nope, she's done with it. When she gets outside, some students have slashed her tire. That must have been a very hard exam. As she walks to the bus and sees Jose, her student teases Ben. Jose rides between cars on his skateboard while she sees a bright aura around his head. She boards a bus, and this guy is shouting about kids blasting music, stands up, then falls. He also has a bright yellow aura around his head. He has had a heart attack as she begins CPR, but he dies. When Rachel gets home, she tells her boyfriend what happened. Then she continues that she saw the same light around Jose, but he skated away fine. He chalks it up to guilt about her quitting teaching. The next morning, the counselor comes in to inform her that Jose was hit by a car and died that morning. Rachel sadly tells her students. A mean boy makes a heartless comment and she sends him to the principal. A nice student comes and comforts her with a quote from the play, Romeo and Juliet, about dying. There are some good ones out there who she just adores. After work, she goes to the intensive care of the hospital where many people are dying. Rachel wants to test if she can see the aura light around the critically ill patients. She sees an old man who has it around his head. She knows he will die soon. When the nurse confronts her, Rachel tells her she is his niece and asks to stay and comfort him. The next day at school, she sees many students with the same omniscient, they're gonna die, halo around their heads. She knows something bad will happen at school that day, and she must do whatever she can to save those students. Rachel tells the principal, Mr. Kerr, about the light and the three people who died soon after. She warns that she saw this light on the heads of many students in the hallway. He angrily dismisses what she says and tells her to stop scaring the students. Kerr states it's a good thing this is her last day because she needs a rest. Typical clueless school administrator. Her boyfriend comes to her in the break room saying Mr. Kerr told him to make sure she leaves. If not, security will escort her out. Seriously? Kerr is more concerned about image? Ben comes to her in her classroom while she is packing up. He asks about the death prediction she's made, how many will die, and if he's one of them. Because high school news travels fast. She says no and refuses to talk about it. He tells her he liked her as a teacher because she spoke the truth. Ben says goodbye and adds he's glad she's leaving campus soon. <laughs> Red flag! It dawns on her that Ben could be responsible for the future deaths at the school. She asks, and the secretary gives her Ben's locker combination. Inside, she finds a sketchbook with all kinds of violent, bloody pictures of people getting killed. The principal sees she has broken into the locker, but she shows him the book, telling him that Ben will do something terrible, but she doesn't know what. Like most administrators, he dismisses the teacher's expertise and judgment and believes her to be crazy. Suddenly, there is a fire alarm, and all students, including them, get dragged outside to one area. 
She again sees dozens of students with the death aura and looks around and notices a rifle overhanging the roof of the school. Not to waste time and alert the shooter's attention, she goes it alone to stop him. You know, at first I thought she was running into the school so she wouldn't get shot. As she heads towards the roof, she sees her own reflection and it has the death glow. When she finds Ben on the roof, she tells him she won't let him kill anyone. He replies, come on, you must hate them as much as I do. That's why you quit. She says, no, that's not true. The death aura appears on him now too. He begins to shoot, so she rushes to him and they both fly over the edge and plummet to the ground. After falling 100 feet, they are badly wounded. Rachel sees the light go dark for Ben as he dies. As the students approach, all their lights go away because they now will live. Her boyfriend is standing over her saying, she did well, she's a hero. Rachel only gazes into the distance saying, it's so beautiful, I see the light, and then she dies. The principal is standing over her like he's angry that she's sleeping on the job. Someone ought to smack some light across his head. Poor Rachel, she did everything to save the students whom deep down she really cared deeply for. A boy, Anthony Fremont, who existed in Peaksville, Ohio, had special powers. Forty years later, Anthony has a daughter, Audrey, and will do anything to protect her. Obviously, uh, his marriage didn't last very long. He has banished all people and places except this small town. Audrey and Timmy are talking about when the world went beyond Peaksville. She falls out of the tree and screams. Her grandmother, Agnes, comforts her, asking her to be quiet so her father, who is playing the piano, will not hear. But Anthony does hear and storms outside. Everyone here must pretend everything is wonderful and only think happy thoughts. All three tell him it was an accident, but he will hear none of it. Timmy's father, George, rides up to take him home. Anthony approaches asking what kind of boy pushes a little girl out of a tree. George slips up and tells Agnes he knew this wasn't a good idea. Anthony reads George's mind and asks why he wouldn't want Timmy to play with his daughter. He accuses George of faking their friendship. Everyone is pleading with Anthony to not hurt the man. Suddenly, George says he's getting hot. Then he bursts into flames. The children are screaming and Agnes begs him to whisk George into the cornfield. Audrey is very angry at what her father did as Agnes tells her to shield all bad thoughts. Suddenly, Audrey says she hates him and telekinetically breaks a picture frame. Her grandmother is surprised that she now has the same power. Agnes says not to tell her father, and Audrey admits he won't know because he can't read her mind, but she can read his. Audrey asks Anthony what happens when people go to the cornfield, and he lies saying they are sent to a happy place. She asks him to please bring George back, and he admits they are gone forever. Agnes takes Audrey for a walk to look at her neighbor Lorna's tomatoes. She confides in Lorna that Audrey has powers like Anthony and asks Audrey to demonstrate them. Lorna and Agnes are so relieved and conspire to have Audrey get rid of the monster Anthony. Agnes is tired of living through all the suffering of watching Anthony get rid of their husbands, Audrey's mother, and most of the entire world. But since he can read their thoughts, no one has ever got close enough to kill him, but now they have Audrey. Later, the townspeople must gather to watch Anthony bowl. Everyone claps and strokes his ego. Anthony notices people paying a lot of attention to Audrey. Lorna is hitting the moonshine pretty hard and told others that Audrey may be their salvation from Anthony. They watch as Anthony forces Joseph to compete with him in a bowling game. The man throws gutter balls, but Anthony insists he do better. His wife pleads for someone to stop him, for they all know what happens when Anthony gets angry. Audrey calls out to her father to play pinball to divert his attention. She then convinces him to go home. 
That was a nice save, and no one has to get corny that night. Later, the drunken Lorna is talking to her tomatoes, and Anthony sneaks up behind her. He can read her mind and knows she and her mother are planning against him. Meanwhile, Audrey is sitting with her grandmother, looking at old photographs. How they traveled to New York, had electricity, and life was good. Audrey asks why her father took everything away, and Agnes admits it was only because they annoyed him. There is a picture of a watch Audrey's grandfather gave to Agnes. Audrey asks why no one has watches anymore, and her grandmother explains that one day he was late and she showed him the time, so he abolished all timepieces in the world. Audrey makes the watch reappear for her. Nice, she can bring things back. Anthony comes back and accuses his mother of keeping secrets. He convinces Audrey to show him her powers, and she does. He calls a town meeting the next day. Lorna is there with her mind erased. Anthony says everyone here must be punished and he starts sending people to the cornfield. Agnes loses it and tells Anthony how much she's hated him all his life. She tells him he is a bad man, a vicious monster, and tells Audrey to wish him to the cornfield. But Audrey sides with her father and wishes her grandmother away instead. It turns out Audrey is even more evil than Anthony is. She calls everyone there sneaky and annihilates them. Now the town is empty and they are the only two left on earth. Anthony admits it's lonely, so Audrey wishes the rest of the world back. They go outside and see an airplane. Audrey tells him she brought back all the countries, buildings, and people. She says she wants to travel the world now, and if anyone is not nice to them along their way, they will be destroyed. Customer dissatisfaction just took on a whole new meaning. A car pulls up with a couple asking directions. The two monsters plan to direct them straight to the cornfield. Now, they will have a car to begin their journey, and Audrey exclaims how fun it will be. Well, those were two very different stories. One was about a person being selfless, and the other about people being selfish. And as always, we want to know what you think in the comments below. If you'd like to watch more from Movie Shortens, please subscribe to be notified about when our next video is posted. Thanks for watching.